morning, everybody. Thanks for coming out to the Warrant Committee tonight. Uh, Jack, thank you especially for making the trip. Uh, I'd like to open uh, with a call for um, a movement on the minutes. I'd like to make a motion that we approve the following minutes, the minutes of October 26th, the minutes of November 19th, the minutes of December 2nd, the minutes of December 9th, the minutes of December 16th, the minutes of September, December 17th with the um, addendum that Steve McGurdy was absent that evening, the minutes of January 4th, 2016, January 6th, January 11th, and January 12th, 2016. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Great. So since Jack is here, I don't want to be wasting his time. Uh, why don't we start right in with uh, looking at the fire department budget. Uh, we have submitted some questions to Jack uh, in advance of his appearance here tonight, and you got back to us. So thanks so much. I really appreciate that. Um, and so folks have those. I emailed out those responses. Um, do you want to start by making some opening comments? I suppose really the only comment that I can make is that uh, we need as much help from you as we can get. We are uh, <laughs> under the best of circumstances, very, uh, very constrained. Okay. Um, and it sounds like I, I'm going to talk a little bit later about a meeting that Ted and I had with uh, our town accountant and um, with our <clears throat> town administrator, and it seems like uh, the cut numbers are a real person possibility if we don't go for an override or the override isn't passed. So um, we're feeling that constraint all across the town, right. unfortunately. And so right. it's, a, it's a reality. I, I did ask um, what it would mean uh, for Chief Grant if we had to make cuts and what that would look like. And, and uh, he was pretty fearful for what that would be, what would that would mean for the fire department. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, we're, uh, unfortunately, uh, the last um, collective bargaining round uh, went basically the full three years before it was settled. So the numbers coming into this year that you were looking at budget-wise from us were FY13 numbers. Uh, so in effect, you know, we're going into this level, you know, level funded, you know, four years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so based on that uh, contingent budget, uh, if if that or based on the non-contingent budget, the the hit that we would take there, uh, we're looking at th at least three jobs, if not a fourth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a, a rough calculation. Your department might be up for anywhere as between ninety and one hundred and twenty thousand in cuts. Just to balance, which is an exercise we're going to have to do. Right. We have right. to balance the non-contingent budget. Mm -hmm. um, so. Well, probably. Yeah, I, I, and I don't remember the, the figure that, uh, as I sat with uh, uh, the town administrator and the uh, town accountant, I don't necessarily remember what the number was at that time, uh, but that, that actually doesn't sound quite as bad. Um, but at the time, it was, you know, three and, and a possibility that you'd have to lose a fourth position. Mm -hmm. you have something else? On, on the subject of, I mean, what do you do if you have to lose two firefighters? You have to, because you're tightly staffed, does that mean that you have to have rolling closures of a fire station throughout the year? Is that is That's that exactly effect? what would happen, yeah. E even, even up to four, as we're currently staffed, uh, and, and we've talked about, and if there's anybody new, I can go into it further, but, you know, if you've been here, you've heard me talking about minimum manning, which is 11 people to have all our apparatus on the road. Uh, the groups are staffed at between 13 and 14 people uh, if everybody's, you know, in and healthy. Uh, so, you know, even with the cut of four, we still remain above minimum manning. So that puts us in a situation where we don't have to permanently close something, but I, I certainly believe from day one that we would be looking at rolling closures. Okay. And when you have rolling closures, that, does that mean that you spread out the burden between the three fire stations or? Honestly, no. Uh, I, I know Chief Larson handled it this way when, uh, when he last uh, had a couple of years where he did some closures. Uh, and I, I believe I would follow the same that he did. 
And what we would do was shut the engine company down at the station right here behind us at headquarters. Uh, reason being is you've then got, you know, we're, we're not, we're no longer balanced throughout the town, but you've got two engines that can come from the outside into the middle. Um, so I, I think that provides the best level of public safety if you're not at full complement. Um, that would probably affect response times. Absolutely. And I know that you, um, oh, it's, you have it's to, not a good situation. Or you, tr you try to adhere to, um, <coughs> Average response times. Uh, what is the effect if you start to go below um, the response time that's expected of a municipal fire department? Everything we do, of of say critical emergency, you know, be it fire, be it uh, medical, uh, everything's time sensitive. Right. So every every minute, every second counts. Uh, so it hurts in that regard. The other thing that it hurts in is multiple responses. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's common to have two engines out on the road on different incidents at the same time, and it's not uncommon to have three incidents taking place at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, in, a month or so ago, uh, we had a, a fire in town, a uh, pretty substantial fire, and at the same time, we took another call for a, a grease fire. Uh, which thankfully was contained to the stovetop, uh, and we also had a CO call at the same time. Uh, so, you know, at that point, you're absolutely scrambling. Right. You know, uh, it, it, when you're at that level, you know, now you're waiting on uh, apparatus to come from other towns. Yeah. Uh, so you're <laughs> you're far further delayed. Okay. So. Steve McCurdy had a question. In Darnell. Yeah, I've got it. Um, over the years, Chief, you've had, um, it, when you've come into us, you've mentioned the, the health of the, your workforce is having a big impact on the budget when it's, somebody's out for an a extended time, other firefighters have to be called in to cover for them. Are we looking at any presently intermediate term or long term disabilities within the workforce? It's hard to predict for 17, I get it, but it, where are we now? There's, uh, as we speak, uh, you know, we, we've got a handful that are out. Um, they're generally not, the last time I was here, I think we had a couple that were gonna, you know, over a year, and even, I think one of them was over two years. So those, those were exceptionally long. No, normally, you're gonna have somebody out for a month to two months, depending on what's going on with them. Uh, it, it just seems that when one happens, you get a rash of them. Uh, at worst, we were, you know, we were at five, uh, and just within the last month, up till then, we, you know, we have been very good this year. Um, we have got one, maybe two of those back, so we're not in horrendous shape this year. But we, you know, we are currently undergoing a little hiccup where we're we are a little bit unhealthy. So if you compound those with cuts. Then that's you know that's where you have to make those hard decisions and I, and I can't really answer that you know completely today but what we'd have to do is is look at you know how that overtime is going uh, and it it'll get to the point where if you are below 11 uh, that you're gonna cut rather than higher to bring yourself to that min minimum manning so it's gonna it's gonna be a half a wait and see thing, you know, depending on how, on how dire the, you know, the budget is July 1st, it may be right from July 1st, it may be, you know, January, it, it may be anywhere in between. I, th I think what I was trying to get at is if you have, uh, you know, low numbers of staffing because you've got some in long-term injuries, mm -hmm. and then on top of that, you have to lose some, some people to budget cuts. Then your workforce has even shrunk more. Not so much for you know the overtime I get, but the manning of the three stations becomes even more acutely difficult. Oh, absolutely. That's that. um, that's what I was trying to get across earlier. Like I said, that minimum manning level is 11. Uh, that staffs three firefighters on each engine, uh, firefighter on the ladder truck, and deputy chief. Uh, that eats up your 11. Um, so. If we if we say easiest way to do it say is to lose four say we're at 13 across the board we lose four 
Now each of those working groups is down to 12, so we're only one above that minimum. Uh, so it, it doesn't give you a lot of leeway. Uh, so you, you get to that hiring point that much quicker, uh, if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you could, because we do have the TV audience, can you tell folks how much is in your general expenses budget that would help you to cover any of that? Zero. <laughs> zero, and, and it's been zero for the probably three or four years at this point. That's, that's, that's the thing. We've, you know, we've exhausted any of those items that might have been, you know, that there might have been a little wiggle room in, you know, not that you're, you know, it's not that you're figuring high, uh, but the, the big one now is um, the personnel, uh, personal uh, day buyback. Um, we fund that at, I believe, sixty-five, sixty-six thousand dollars and the reason we do that is it's a contract, contractual obligation. Uh, and everybody on the job over there has the right to sell those days back. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things that you, you know, you keep it there just in case. Uh, they tend not to, uh, but that was the very last thing that we really kind of said, all right, you know, now we're going to have to shift this over and, and cover something else. Um, so we really truly have every line item that we've been able to squeeze down is squeezed down as far as we're comfortable going with it. Darnell, thanks for waiting. Yep. Uh, question for you. Not only do we have coverage in our town that we have problems, we're in agreement with our local towns in this area um, to be their backup and support. Um, I guess my question is, what happens if we have to say no? I, <laughs> as long as I'm in that office, regardless of what our staffing is, I'm not going to say no. Um, mutual aid is one of those things when, when they're calling for help, they need help. Uh, yeah. And put it this way, worst case is if, if you say no, you're, you know, they're going to say no. Uh, and, and if we're saying no because we're understaffed, we're going to need them at least as much as they need us. Uh, like you say, I, I, we could be understaffed and I would still send that engine because we've ha had situations where engines have had to go out of town and you've had a, you know, a man trapped uh, and, and these towns need help fast uh, and you know, they need manpower as quick as they can get. It's, it's critical. So what you rely on in that case is that you know, you're, you're maintaining your mutual aid to the best of your ability and you can always bring someone from a little further out in here uh, to, to back you up. Uh, so that we haven't had to do that, but if you have to move a piece out of town, say we're going to Randolph, I could always call and have a dedum piece of apparatus come and help us out. The problem with mutual aid comes that if we if we're running understaffed and we have to start calling them for routine stuff uh it'll get to the point where they won't come uh this has happened in the past when you know cities and towns aren't providing the level of staffing that's required that you'll get um the other cities and towns to say look if you have an incident we will come but if we're coming over to cover you because you're running an engine short and sitting in the station. We're not going to do that. So it does create issues if, if you're on demand. Can you do me a favor and repeat that, but a little louder? <laughs> no, I'm serious. Can I, you I do that be, because I'll be happy I, to. I think um, that has to really be understood. Mm -hmm. Exactly that point, then that's why I suppose that exactly has to be understood that, you know, yeah, we can call, oh, we're going to save dollars. It does put lives in danger. It absolutely and, and, does. And we need really people to understand that as we go forward and we're looking at those contingent and non-contingent budgets and what actually those cuts mean in the fire department. Mm -hmm. So I think that's important. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, if, if I could say it a little differently and go back to the the thought that I threw out earlier that uh, take, the, take the fire we had uh, earlier where we had all of our apparatus there and then some. Uh, you know, that went early, early on in the incident, and, and I believe the calls came in prior to the third alarm, uh, the additional calls. Um, 
So at a second alarm level, we've got Randolph and Canton on scene with us, and Boston comes in and covers the station. So let's now say that we're down an engine, we're closed, and we've got two incidents going on, two medical calls, uh, so we're all tied up, and that third call comes in, like you say, which you know, it, it's not an every day or an every week occurrence, but it, it happens frequently enough that it's a, a concern. Uh, so now we're calling another engine in for, uh, you know, from out of town for um, a minor motor vehicle accident or just station coverage. Uh, and it's, it's known, and it will be known, that it's, you know, the coverage is needed because we're running short staffed. That is when those cities and towns will say, look, you know, this is created by you. We cannot help you in this instance. You know, if you have a fire incident, if you need that extra help, we will absolutely send apparatus to the scene of the emergency, but we're no longer covering your station. Um, to the point about uh, sending a certain amount of equipment to a call, can you tell us, I, I've heard, you know, over the years that there are a lot of calls to, say, Fuller Village that may not be necessary to send all the equipment that gets sent there. I know that sometimes fire and police both get sent even though the incident may not be described as a police incident. But we want to make sure that we have the right equipment and people there to deal with the problem. Can you just talk about what drives that and if there's any savings or differences that can be, that can be implemented that, that would help alleviate pressure on the rest of the system? There really isn't, uh, reason being that, that the response is driven by the nature of the call. Mm -hmm. um, anything that's deemed to be fire-related, uh, you know, potential fire-related, uh, gas leak, you know, could change suddenly, uh, gets a, a box alarm put on it. And a box alarm response is the nearest two engines and the ladder truck, as well as the deputy chief. You know, you're heading there that you're gonna go to work, uh, you're probably gonna need more help uh, if, if something is actually taking place at that point in time. So, you know, those types of calls just require that response. Um, beyond that, you know, you'll have uh, motor vehicle accidents, um, good intent calls, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of calls that you know that are of lesser emergency. Those are what we call still alarms, and the response is one engine. Mm -hmm. So, like I say, the calls are set up by the nature of the call, or the response, I should say, is set up by the nature of the call you receive. Uh, you, can't, you can't take a fuller village and say, <clears throat> Most of the time we go up there, it's food on the stove, it's a minor incident. Right. Uh, you know, because all of those places that we do, you know, multiple runs to, uh, you know, Milton Academy, Curry College, Fuller <coughs> Village, um, Mil uh, uh, what's the one? Um, Milton Hill House, uh, all of them. Yeah. Uh, we've had fires at every one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and you just don't know that based on the phone call. Right. Um, you know, we've had phone calls that came in that would be considered minor in nature, and we've pulled up, and it's been a cardiac arrest. Uh, you know, you have to send what the call warrants and yep. expect that it may be, you know, far bigger than what you expect pulling up. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a question on, uh, you want to go ahead, Ted? No, I'm just wondering in terms of the response. Um, when you have a cardiac arrest, that was probably, uh, you got a call saying, I have an, emer an emergency medical situation mm -hmm. or something like that. Yep. And you dispatch one engine? We dispatch one engine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and everybody on that engine has, has um, emergency medical training? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Does pretty much everybody have emergency medical training? Yes, to different levels. Uh, everybody has everybody on the job has first responder level, uh, and and that training takes place every year. Uh, two two thirds of the department, a little, little over, I believe it's like forty one or forty two, 
are trained at the emergency tech, uh, medical technician level. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, everybody is trained to at least a basic level. So there's usually an EMT trained person on the engine. Yes. Yep. Okay. Because I noticed that um, the pay or the recompense for EMT certification jumped mm -hmm. considerably in, with your last contract from right. over three years from 500 to 1100 a person. Um, and I'm wondering, is there a cost involved to the firefighter uh, for that training per year? Uh, there is no direct cost, no. No direct cost, okay. Um, but every time there's an emergency call and the fire engines show up, police also show up. Generally, right? yes. Okay. And an ambulance. And an ambulance. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> um, concerning overtime, I had sent you a question about this because I noticed that in your two budgets, Yep. You had put in an overtime increase request in the contingent budget, mm -hmm. but not in the non-contingent. And that begged the question, well, what would you do with the extra overtime in, the, in a contingent scenario that you're not doing in a non-contingent? And your response basically was, you, you need the overtime yeah. in the non-contingent as well, but you weren't given the opportunity to do an increase. Um, so can you talk to wh what, is, what are we losing by not having that in your non-contingent request? That, well, that goes back to my opening statement that basically, you know, that we are bound, you know, by a level, mm -hmm. level dollar submission and mm -hmm. we're submitting figures that are four years old, yep. uh, which were tight four years ago, by the way. Uh, it, we've seen it the last couple of years where, I think the last two, if not the last three, that, it, you know, I've had to come and ask for some level of reserve fund transfer to get through the year. Yep. Uh, it just... So it, the 450 figure that we've put in the uh, contingent budget uh, is is realistically corrects the situation and puts us where we need to be. And say say in a perfect world, you fund me at that level, and then I ask each year for what the wage increase was as a little bump in the overtime. This problem doesn't exist. Yeah, I. I understood that in maybe decades ago, uh, the way you handled overtime if you ran out was to have rolling closures of, of the stations rather than coming in for our reserve fund transfer. Is that right? I or don't believe so. Maybe not you, but... Yeah, no, and, and, and I'll, I'll explain further. I, decades ago, I don't believe so. Uh, okay. As far as I know, the only time that it's ever happened was just prior to me. Uh, there was two years that Chief Larson uh, had that happen. Uh, and the Board of Selectmen at the time vowed that it would never happen again. Uh, so, and, and up until now, it hasn't. Uh, I don't believe, and I could be wrong, but uh, uh, I don't believe it had ever happened before then. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, I know you've had a budget of a static line of 300000 for over time for the last several years. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I was hoping maybe you'd, you'd have a chance to look at what your actual overtime was against, against your actual base pay to see if there's any correlation there and, and if both those lines are trending up and you're stuck with a flat 300,000, that's partly your answer of why you need it. Right, uh, but, right. But uh, it would be good to see that. Um, yeah, I could tell you last time you and I talked and looked at it as a, as a percentage, <coughs> I did those figures, and our overtime is funded uh, in, in a six-year average. Our overtime is funded at 5.6% of the um, salary and wages lines, and mm -hmm. we're spending overtime at about 8.5%, maybe a little higher than that. Um, I have those figures with me here. Okay. And you also noted in your answer to, to 5. that. 5.6 yeah. and, and 8.5, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. But you did also note, I, I asked you to try to compare that to other oh, yeah. similar size yep. communities. Um, I, ha I actually have those as well. Uh, near as I can see, uh, I rounded up on the amount, uh, but it looks like I did that back in FY12. Mm. And let's see. 
again, what I did was I took departments that were similarly, similarly sized in the metro area, so all paid professional departments. Uh, I, I took numbers uh, of departments that were, say, 10 higher than us to 10 below. And I can just read that down real quick. Uh, the highest uh, was a 56-man department uh, that spent $797,000 on overtime. Uh, a 61-man department at $744,000. 64 at 737,000. A 60-man department at 650,000. 53-man department at 549,000. 55-man department at 485,000. A 50-man department at 465,000. Then we came in with a 54-man department at 432,000. Uh, below us, we had a 47-man department at 407, a uh, 45-man department at 347, 50-man department at 300, and a 56-man department at 295. So who was the 50-man department at 300? <laughs> Any idea? Uh, That's I, pretty close to your budget. <laughs> I, I know. Yeah, I don't know. And, and, and the other one is the 56 at 295. They're both in the same boat. Uh, some place with buildings that don't catch on fire. Well, I, I, no, don't, yeah. well, well, I did, for, for their own good, I did not put names to this. Uh, <laughs> you know, so I don't, I don't get some other city or town in trouble, but I don't know how you do that, to be honest with I mean, you. Half of your calls are for emergency right. medical uh, situations. But I'm, I'm just, uh, I mean, are any of those communities have a different fire structure? Do any of them... Are any of them not on the 24-hour shift? Uh, I would say, and I, I can reach out and try to track this down, but I would say in, in the metro area, and uh, uh, no, I believe everybody is on 24-hour shifts at this point. The, the most, uh -huh. it could be wrong. I'll, I'll find that out, Ted. Uh, it wouldn't be more than you know one to two. Uh, Boston would be the most recent one that was holding out, and they just went... Quincy may be on days and nights still. I'm, I'm not sure, but I'll ask around tomorrow and I'll email that to you. I'm just wondering if historically there's any impact on overtime. I can actually give you those figures because I'm sure they haven't changed. I, I happened to be the union president when that was bargained uh -huh. in. Okay. And the, the common trend for that was that in the first two to three years, Guys way back in the day sold that, that there was going to be a huge savings in overtime. Uh, it, it panned out as the initial cities and towns that did this, those that were trailing behind, you know, the thought came is, you know, be honest, don't go <coughs> saying you're going to save a whole lot of money in overtime. The trend seemed to be that for the first three years or so, you would in fact save overtime. By going to the 24 By hour. going to the 24s. But as you got into it, you know, things tend to le tended to level out. And for the most part, it went the same. In rare occasions, there were cities and towns that became higher. Uh, so for the most part, it, it levels out and it's, it's even money. Yeah, I mean, I, I would think if you, if you catch a 24-hour bug, You're that, missing there, two goes rather th than there goes three eight-hour shifts. Well, we don't, do th we don't do three. We do two. In a 24-hour period, we do a 10-hour day and a 14-hour night. And that was the same when we weren't working 24. So, yeah, you, you, but you, what you're saying is right. Uh, if, you're, if you're out sick for a 24-hour bug, you're missing two shifts rather than potentially one shift. All right. Um, your request for a contingent budget and there is a good possibility that we will have an, um, we will vote for an override. Uh, includes a new training officer, lieutenant? Yeah, that, in discussion with the town administrator, that has come out of there. Okay. It's still on the paperwork that you see before you, but that will not be uh, taking place. Okay. From both budgets? From both budgets, okay. yes. Steve? Chief, going back to the, the 24 hour shift, taking off your union hat and put it on the chief hat, uh -huh. would it be any more easy for you to manage a shorter shift or any more economical to manage a shorter shift than the 24 hour shift? No, it's really the same. Uh, it's, it was amazing really to see when it, when it went together that you actually work 
you still work that 10 hour day and 14 hour night, we've just slid them over. Uh, you actually work the exact same amount of shifts per year. Uh, everything about it really just stayed the same. Uh, so it, it really is a neutral effect. Betty? Um, I want to go back to the medical calls. Um, can you describe how it was decided that the response would be a fire truck, an ambulance, and a police response, how that was decided? And uh, the other part of that question is thinking about Randolph and Canton and some of the other communities that you cover and mm -hmm. do mutual aid for, do they have the same um, pattern of response for medical emergencies? Yeah, that's pretty uniform. Okay. Uh, and I really... You know, more so us in the ambulance rather than factoring in the police. Uh, I can say that, that you've got one ambulance in town. Uh, you don't know where they are at any given time. So the thought with the engine and the ambulance is that a, a, a large percent of the time, depending on where the call is, we're going to beat them in. You do. Uh, and uh, that three-man engine company also is perfectly outfitted for CPR, um, where you've got, you know, say you, you walk in, you've got somebody that's in cardiac arrest, you've got two firefighters that instantly will start two-man CPR, and during that period of time, the third firefighter is setting up the defibrillator. So it really is a, a good working team, a good model for emergency medical service. Can you talk, um, so you settled the, con so can you talk about the contract status? Uh, yeah, that's... Um, settled? Settled as, you know, at, at the very end of uh, fiscal 16, coming into to 17, they settled it. And so now you're back... So now we're under current figures, you're yes. Current figures, and you're under contract. And when does that ex... That was a three-year, uh, so we will, 17, 18, 19, we'll be, they'd be back out in 20. 20, okay, thank you. A uh, different question. Oh, on whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You settled a three-year contract. Oh, um, you're right. I see exactly where you're going. We settled a three-year contract. You settled a three-year contract going back. So we, are, we are back out as of uh, as of July 1st coming up. Right. So, yeah. we, okay, so we'll I'm be... Sorry, they, really? I saw the look in your face and I said, oh, I'm, I'm wrong. So the goal is to have a title. You, you would like to be, and we never have been, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, you know, we came in... In from a period of time where we were always a couple of years behind, and then we went through a period of time where just because of the economy, we were doing quick one-year deals. We stayed. We haven't been in arrears for a good many years until this last three. Um, but yeah, you'd love to be current and moving forward. Yeah, I just want to say that. And thank you for that, Ted. I caught that look. So, but but I, I'm I'm glad you're up to date now. And if you could stay that way, if that would we be could really stay nice. that way. Because the accounting hassles that you run into when, when there's, you have to put a set aside, set aside. do a wage set aside are horrendous, oh. especially if it's not town wide. I mean, we're looking yep. at a town wide wage set aside now, but, but, we, but when it's just one department, it goes one year, two year. Three year, two and two and a half, and wrapping up in three. Yeah, so, it's and, and like you say, in this particular instance, it literally was wrapping up June twenty eighth or 29th, and that those set asides were going to go away. It was, <laughs> it was a nightmare scrambling at the end of at the end of this one. No, it was it was good you settled when you did. Um, yeah, we'd be in a lot deeper hole if we didn't. Somebody had asked you about um, contract budgets, and you were going to check with the Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I, I had that answer, and I just got running around. Uh, realistically, we do not have any large contracts um, uh, so that we do not bid them out. We've really only got uh, a software uh, maintenance contract and office uh, maintenance contract, uh, and, and they really amount to very little dollars. Okay. Is that a cleaner's custodial contract? No, no, it's more maintenance on, well, like the printers and that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, custodial, yes, we, as far as custodial <laughs> goes in the firehouse, we do it ourselves. Oh. Uh -huh. Good to know. Um, so last year we were all looking at, uh, at the repairs needed for the fire 
mm-hmm. department. We're going to ask you Ted just stole my next question. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Um, and the critical repairs were, I don't know, two hundred eighty thousand dollars, and you were funded for one hundred and forty-five thousand. Uh, have those repairs taken place? E, the vast majority of them have, yes. Uh, the heating systems have been uh, repaired. The fire alarm system has been repaired. The drainage system uh, has been repaired. Uh, there's a couple of you know minor things that are still taking place this week even. Uh, uh, some uh, exit doors that needed to be replaced. Um, but for the, for the bulk of it has been done. Okay, because the, the original analysis was that you needed about $555,000 of repairs, 280 of which were critical, and you only got 145, but you're feeling pretty good about I'll, yeah. the results. The levels, you know, the, the, level, the critical stuff has been done, yes. Uh, Great. You know, the, like I say, heat, you know, fire alarms and COs. Uh, the big issue with the, the drainage system was liability. Should we, uh, you know, have that malfunction and, and you know, throw water and oil out and into the public. Uh, so, yeah, the, the critical ones have been done. Uh, not to say that there's not going to be more critical ones come up. Um, you know, Bill and I will be looking at that as, as we move along. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, we're really being careful not to, you know, not to do routine stuff, not to do stuff that we can live with between now and, and this study taking place and seeing where we're going to go. Right. You're okay. Um, I wanted to ask a follow-up on the study because I saw there was some traffic going back and forth where there was going to maybe be an article in May on putting together a fire station needs uh, mm-hmm. study um, looking at either rehabilitation or replacement of, yep. the, of the three stations. seems like that's now pushed out to at least October. Um, can you talk a little bit about your involvement maybe with that process? Yeah, it's, uh, it's ongoing and uh, it's, it's well underway at this point. Uh, I would expect that, uh, and, and I don't necessarily disagree uh, that, it, it, you know, that we can't push that out a little bit to form an actual building committee. Uh, but I would believe that we would be ready uh, this town meeting to give a report on what the best way we feel to go would be. Okay. Uh, they've, got, uh, they've got some uh, layouts and, and sketches done at this point in time. They have not made the comparison uh, yet as to whether it's viable to you know, save old and add on and, and renovate or whether it has to be new, that that has yet to be conducted. But I expect that would be ready for a town meeting. Okay. So going back to what you opened up with, you said you, you needed as much help as you could get from us. Um, but uh, even, even if I'm trying to be um, critical of your budget, I'd say you didn't ask for all that much except for the, the additional bump in overtime. So what, what is it that you really would, would like from the warrant committee um, that would really help your department? Just, just that. If if you could fund me at that level and not not cut anything else, I'd be happy. Okay. Uh, we're really not. You know, it's a simple budget. Our our needs in all are relatively simple. I don't come in asking for anything we don't need, uh, and I don't ask for more than we need. Um, you know, okay. uh, I'm <laughs> well, that would be a great conversation to be able to have if we do decide to go out for an override. But if we don't, then. I don't think we'll have that option to have that well, conversation. Well, no, it's, it's you know, like you say, it's, you know. It's cuts, not It's asking. can we sustain ourselves, mm-hmm. you know, and that's going to be if the override goes out and passes, mm-hmm. or what are the cuts going to be? Uh, okay. that's, that's where we are at, and, you know. All right. Uh, so, so make the cuts as small as you can on, on, a, <laughs> on a non-contingent budget. And, right. <coughs> and make any cuts on a contingent budget as small as possible. Other questions for Chief Grant? Yes, Ted. Um, so you're getting, a, I believe, the Capital Improvement Planning Committee has recommended a new truck for you? Uh, yes, yeah. Okay. Um, is this, you want to tell us about it? I mean, is it small enough to fit into the, all the doors? Or <laughs> That, you know, it's funny. That's, that's not all that big a joke. No. Uh, you do have, I could buy an engine that wouldn't fit. 
uh, put it that way. It's one of those things that, it, you know, you have to have that conversation. Uh, hopefully the models have not, we haven't gone out yet because uh, um, the yeah, money is actually not uh, available at this point in time. No, it isn't. But. Um, so, you know, I, I expect that the design uh, that we're looking at has not changed that much, uh, but that's something we will be very careful with because uh, in the current stations, that, that's an issue. Um, I, I don't expect it to be a problem. Uh, so what does the rest of your fleet look like? What is the turn on that? The, I mean, this is a half a million dollar engine. So. It, the, we have been replacing them every, every 15 years. Uh, and right now, we, in a <coughs> perfect world, when I, when I put this in, uh, it was, we replace the engines every 15 years, we'll keep the engine that was replaced for an additional five, so nothing in the fleet on the street is more than 20 years old. Uh, this particular time around, the engine that we'll be replacing is engine four up on Blue Hill Ave, uh, and as it turns out, we're having more issues with that than we are engine three, which is the current spare engine. Mm -hmm. So the plan now for this this turnaround will be actually to keep engine two or the old engine two, engine three, for an additional five years and get rid of engine four. It seems, it seems to be the right mix. Uh, you know, you hit ten years, and you definitely see a, a big upswing in the amount of not maintenance but repair that takes place. Uh, I, you know, I, the repairs are viable during that period of time uh, and just from ancient history before we established this uh, replacement plan there was in a four-year plan or in a four-year time span we replaced three out of four pieces of apparatus two of those pieces of apparatus died on the floor and were emergency purchases uh, and it's one of those things it's it's quite simple we've got three engines you know 15 years <laughs> You know, replace one every five, uh, and and like I say, just looking at the at the upswing and repair from ten to fifteen, mm -hmm. and then you know, the memory of what happens when they're beyond fifteen years old. I think we're doing it right at this point in time. That's great. I, I just have one other question. What what is a Halligan? <laughs> <laughs> uh, a Halligan is. It, it's actually a very, very important tool for us. It's, uh, you know, about 28 to 36 inches, uh, 28 inches to 36 inches long. It's got a fork on one end. Uh, it's got a hook on the other and, and then kind of a, a pick point on it. So you can force doors with it. You can turn gas, uh, gas mains off with it. Uh, you know, you can, you can ventilate windows with it. It's, it's really a, a quite unique, universal tool. I really thought you would have asked what a knuckle headlight was. <laughs> no. Actually, that's I'm gonna just assume that's a brand name. That's a brand name, <laughs> yeah. Great, any last questions? Oh, Michael, latecomer. Don't ask anything we asked while you weren't here. I wanted to make a compliment on the uh, incident type report that came this year. <laughs> because I think I remember last year asking a question about how could we have had 140 fires and the property damage was only $157,000. And you said something like, well, we don't. It doesn't get reported. We don't report it. Yeah. <clears throat> but it looks like now with, what is it, 1.8 million in estimated losses on 187 fires that you're in the ballpark. Yeah. It's like, you know what? I'm going to say the right deputy hit the, hit the reports on those days. <laughs> Because <laughs> this it's the same reporting system. <laughs> well, you know, to make a judgment, I just want I was trying to say a nice thing here. Like, you know, <laughs> one good day, I, or else I, I appreciate like, no, that. And, and I will say, I fall on the end of, of trying to estimate dollar loss on a fire. You know, you. <laughs> I won't say you're completely making it up, but you're making it up, <laughs> you know? Uh, all right, this looks like it's an $800,000 house. That's a $600,000 loss. Right. It's really not that accurate, you know? Um, now, one other part of this, the state report has how many service injuries there were, and, and it's only up through 2013. So in 2013, Milton says there were four ser fire service injuries. Do, how many were there in this period? How many people got hurt on the job? 
I'd have to go back and look. Uh, it, we, it, oh, dur during that, that's yeah. last year. Uh, I would still have to go back and look. We, we did have a number of people out, but on my end, they all blend together. If you're out sick or you're out injured, it's still a firefighter that I don't have. Uh, the difference is if they were hurt on the job is I'm paying the medical bills. But like I say, they, they can tend to, tend to blend. So okay. I'll, I can I'll, go back and get I'll that send information. You, can I send them an email and ask for that number? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I, can break that, I can break that down okay. for you. I'd be happy no, to. No more questions. You, so you don't need up. my permission. <laughs> my question <laughs> quotient. Uh, I was teasing Michael for being late, but he was late because he was volunteering on another group. So, you know, <laughs> he's got to spread his time around. Um, thanks so much for coming in. Thank really you all for having me. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Have a good night. Good luck. I know this is a difficult year for every budget, so. <laughs> I appreciate that. <clears throat> Chief Wells, you're up next. And you're here early. Thank you so much for coming. Early. Do you have any sort of a presentation to put into the computer or no, anything? Tonight, tonight I took you off. The, I was going to, but I, um, you'd be here at 11 o'clock. Oh. Darn it. They were really excited Bless for you. it. Yeah, I, I think you've. <laughs> The, you stiffed us last year on the I did not. No, 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 no. We had a nice presentation I, 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 last, I, I, year. last year. I was yeah, here was for the great. presentation. Maybe it was two Nine years miles, ago. the whole thing. Yeah, I remember the discussion about ago. how many bridges there are that come from Boston into Milton. I was really... What's the answer? I don't know, it was nine, six? Five. Five, six, five, five, five through Milton. <laughs> five through Milton. Name them? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that was in the presentation, to my own defense. It was a sidebar. So um, I will have a... Um, first, thank you for having me. <laughs> How many years do you have, Don? I don't know. You, you, you should be putting it for a pension. <laughs> After the override, he's going to do it. <laughs> so, which, thank you, buddy. Um, obviously, we're going to have a fight. This, not a fight, but a, a we're gonna, going to need a Herculean effort to pass an override. Correct. Correct. So I put it together that presentation, and I will give it to you first before I go out publicly with it. In the last override, what we did was the presentation we put together was actually called it had a name. It was called "Cops Count Policing Matters in Milton," and we will take the presentation that usually we just give to you, and we will meet with. Um, all the town meeting members, by precinct, by neighborhood, as I said to the chair of the Board of Selectmen today, to succeed in an override, you have to roll up your sleeves and be prepared to walk into living rooms, senior centers, schoolyards. It doesn't, it's not about, it's not about, uh, it is about departments in a way, but it's really about the community as a whole, the 0286 zip code because the override, regardless of whatever the amount you vote on, or, or the collectively in the, in the Board of Selectmen, if they do vote to put one on the ballot, <clears throat> it's something that should it not pass, will have a negative effect on the quality of life in this community. Yeah. We don't usually lose overrides. And I say this being involved in the very first override as I was vice president of the Patrolman's Union when we went to a meeting at Joe McGetrick's house. I didn't even know what an override was. And he tried to convince us, just as union members, why we would want to be involved. And for those of you who know me, in the last one, I actually tried to be chair of the override committee to the ethics committee, so I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that will kind of, for those of you who don't, me, don't know me, um, it kind of paints the picture of how I view this community and what's in it, not just from a policing perspective, but from a community perspective. And um, because we all have expectations. For me, or for us, because I'm, <coughs> I'm just the voice piece. And if you fall off, I've been a little bit in the news lately, not that I wanted to be, but I have been. Um, but, um, People want to be, from my perspective, the way we look at things, I'm going to answer any questions that you have, and people want to be safe. It's a basic human right. 
We're going to be safe in our homes. We're going to be safe in our schools. We're going to be safe in our yards and in the streets that we walk in. And the men and women who work for this police department do a very good job of doing that. For those of you who don't know, on Sunday, if you were at the Suckman's meeting last night, I am humbled to be traveling with 10 senior law enforcement executives on a terrorism mission to Israel for eight days. We're going to meet with senior executives from Israel and share best practices and common commonalities between the way they approach things and the way we do. You know, terrorism probably isn't a thing that you'd associate when you think of a 0286 area code, but um, things like active shooter and violence in workplaces and incidents like we've seen in Paris and in California and in so many places are something that in this town where we have almost 12,000 students now very high on our radar screen. Mm -hmm. So I'm very privileged to go there and do that. But one of the things that, and I've, I've seen policing in Ireland, I've spoken at the National Police College there, all over the United States, from New York to Seattle to California to Florida. And whenever I have the opportunity to bring someone here, I am so thrilled to be able to drive them around this town and then just drive them a hop not even in a skip, into Boston. And it really says a lot about a community like ours that is so unique, that can have the quality of life that you see around here, but yet have such a close geographic proximity in such a large way to the capital of Massachusetts. And that's pretty says a lot about the people who live here and the makeup and, and what this town's all about. So in that way, it, it does mean a great deal to me personally as well as professionally, and so, um, we have our work cut out for us, but I think there's a very valid reason why we need to do that. Betty agrees with me already. She already, I already know she does. <laughs> <coughs> it's probably why she, half the reason why she's on this committee. You got it. See? <laughs> um, thank you for uh, your opening comments and also for um, including a narrative with your, um, with your budget. One thing that was really helpful was the background <coughs> section. You walked us through the differences between the contingent and the non-contingent request, and uh, they're pretty easily delineated. Um, and I was wondering if you might just comment on those, especially the, the two positions that, that... Right, so when I became chief, and, and, and it's really simple math, I don't even, that's not my strong point, but it just, I run the budget though, I take care. When I became chief, 55 officers. The 55 officers was a number that came out of a 1992 extensive study that was done by the International Chiefs of Police and paid for by the selectmen of this town. And at that point, based on our call service volume, all these things, they determined that we should have a police force built upon 55 officers. That was only at about 24,000 people. Today we have 27,000 in building. A place like Curry, which great partner to us has become a city to itself. You know, things have changed. The one singular bridge, the Mattapan Bridge, takes 60,000 cars a day through our community. That's one out of five. Um, and what happened just, and it, it's funny, I, I say sometimes like Kathy Fagan, who was on the board when I was appointed, and we'll talk about this, I'm like, I don't even know how it happened. Like all of a sudden, cut a, cut a budget, tighten your belt, do this, do that. We had the 2009 override and then the nine seat cuts that came in from the governor that year almost took, and that was the largest override historically that this town ever passed. I think it was 3.2. Was it my right around 3.2? And a big, for us operationally, the, the gains we made on that one right out the window months later. Um, so the next thing we were down to 50 offices, and just, and now I'm here nine years, and we still haven't gotten back to 55. <clears throat> on top of that, in 1992, there was no such thing as a school resource officer. There was very little other than like doing crossings and responding to calls as far as an operational daily staffing allotment in the high schools. Today, it's two officers, and even though they take a lot of responsibility for all the schools, the, the bulk of their work between the high school and the PS Middle School, now that's two bodies right there that didn't even exist. So even the two that I'm asking for is only getting me back to the 55. So that's, that's, that was the opening. In the non-contingent, that goes out the window. If you remember last year, it was what I argued very strongly for, and I really thank Tom Hurley back when he was chair last time, not this time, 
that at least help us get it up to 53. And then the school committee who, um, in realizing the need for the second SRO, there was just no way we could pay it. If they wanted it, they would have to contribute to it. They pay the second officer's salary. Mm -hmm. um, so um, those two positions would be gone. And the only other thing that uh, I added in there was was uh, two new motorcycles because equipment we just try to keep in like a bottom line dollar. The reason I put two is you're at a point where two, e two equals three. The resale on a police motorcycle is so great. You trade two, you get three. So we're at that point right now where we get a free motorcycle, it's worth it to, to go to do it now. So that's, that's why I added that. Um, there isn't really a lot more to cut. I, I, I am aware that you asked me a question about any additional cuts on the non-contingent. Emory and I have not had that discussion yet. Um, I don't know what it would be. You know, it depends on what happens. Um, I'm not sure. We haven't, we haven't crossed that bridge yet. I, I, I will tell you this. You become very good at level service budgets. Yeah. We just have, you know, uh, and but I give you credit. I give everyone in the town credit that you sells the board of selectmen town meeting because 2009 was seven years out from an override. Tech historically would have been five. You know, two. Do we do it for two years? We did it at least two. Do we do level dollar for three years or just two years? Um, it was at least two with the give back. Level dollar with you know restoring. <clears throat> with the give backs, right, restoring, which was. I mean, it made it work. It stretched it. I, I will say, and I know, go ahead, Don. I'm sorry. Three years. Three years. Three years. Three, so years. three years. I will say, you know, sometimes it's easy to, to be a naysay. You know, it's easy to say, and go, oh, you know, there's fat, there's this and that and the other thing. I, I do give everyone here credit and the people who sat here before you because it was a, proactive yet almost a little bit visionary way to get us through those years without <coughs> having like major cuts. And even for the department, it was a very collegiate of effort. And I give Anne Marie a lot of credit because she walked in in the middle of all this and as you know, it worked. But I think we all know that it's not gonna work forever. It just isn't. So I don't give long answers tonight, so I apologize. So, but that's pretty much the the difference between the non-contingent and the contingent from our perspective this year. Okay. Darnell, you had a question? Uh, yes. Um, and I, answer, I have answers oh. for all your questions you gave me as well. Go yeah. ahead. Open time. All right. Okay. The, rea the realistic numbers in the non-contingent budget of open time there, is that going to be realistic or are we are going to be looking at, well, we can't just do this. We're going to have to try to find some extra money somewhere. So... One of the things that I wrote back to you was, um, and I, as much as possible and done this, I try as hard as we can to manage the overtime, what, what we get for overtime every year. Historically, I don't like to come back for RFTs for overtime. So that makes it, you know, it's a weekly endeavor for us. So if, if you have a week where a lot of things happen and you have to spend more than you think you're gonna spend, then you gotta find weeks to cut back. It's, just, it's you know it's it's as simple as that. Um, I don't know if I, I mean I don't want to break that promise. I'll be honest, you know I'm, I've never done it yet. I don't want to, and so I'm <coughs> going to try and find a way to make it work no matter what happens. Will I be happy? No. And you know me, I'm not going to come look for frivolous things, but if I thought it was something that serious, I would definitely come back to you. And I think one of the only ones I, it's only a couple of RFTs. One of them was when I think we just got hit with like four elections in one year, which was more than I was prepared to have budgeted. It just, it was a special election, and a, a primary, and it just, that was the only one I can really think of for money. But I would make it work one way or the other. I want to circle back uh, to what we were just talking about a minute ago about the, about the potential of cuts to departments if we do not go for an override and we have to go with the non-contingent budget. Um, Ted and I had a meeting yesterday and uh, along with some of the town officials came up with um, some potential cut numbers um, 
and I'm going to go through this a little more in detail later with the committee. But let's say the worst case scenario is that the stormwater article doesn't pass and we don't have an override. We're looking at about $400,000 in cuts to the town side budgets. That doesn't include what we're talking about for the school side budget. And looking on a proportional basis, without considering other factors, that could mean a potential cut to the police department of around $120,000. What would that mean for From your department? From the non-contingent? Mm. Correct. Because we, we have to put something like that on paper anyway. We have to present a non-contingent budget that balances. Above what I've presented in my non-contingent now? Right so now, right now when we add up below. all the non-contingent budgets, right. we end up with a deficit of more than $1.1 $1. $1 million. Yeah, okay, so that. we have to cut back at least 1.1 1 .1 something million dollars in order to get to level funding. That probably would mean about a $120,000 cut to the police department. Or more if you got it. <laughs> <laughs> you should stick to singing, don't go into comedy. You have to have humor in tough times. <clears throat> um, well, at 120, you'd you're getting into personnel. There's just no way, you know, you either... I mean, the areas I've cut historically have either been overtime, personnel, and new equipment. The rest of it's all contrived. I mean, you, you can't not buy gas. You can't not pay your electric bill. You can't not buy uniforms. You, about 90% of the budget is, is contractual obligations, whether it's personnel contracts, whether it's maintenance contracts, whether it's your radio contracts, whatever it is. Um, I wouldn't, I don't want to say, I mean, in my head, I, if I had to do it as an exercise, I could do it right now, but I don't want to say because I'm not sure that's exactly how I would do it. I'd have yeah. to go back. And, and, and we it. sprung the number yeah. on you, so I, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, so I would, I don't know how much in personnel, how much, I mean, once, I've had to do worse exercises. Mm -hmm. But, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I would say it was a combination. There's not a lot you can take out of the general side. It's just, there's not a lot there, so... Um, you're definitely at some point going to cut something on the personnel side. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have something on that? So just make, if it's, let's say it's a, let's say you have to cut a police officer. So the whole year in now just gets deeper and you're back in it again. Right. So you're like trying and trying to, trying to get out and you can't. And the one thing about the police department is, and, and I, I, I don't, I mean, I do believe, you know, we are a team. We all, we work, we approach everything collectively we may have different specific missions different disciplines but we we work very well together for the most part the department heads um, you know it could be easy for me to come in and pump my chest and say you know do you know what we do we never stop we don't sleep with this with that with but I'm not going to do that I think you all kind of have a pretty good idea of the role this police department plays it's it's deeply woven into every fabric of government here, every entity from the schools to other department agencies to the clergy to neighborhood associations to, you know, I, I always would say to myself, our biggest night of the year to me to give back to the community is to invite the community to our police station just to break bread with us and have one night and every year you get 2,000 or 2,500 people come. I know the hot dogs are free, but it says a lot about the fact that the community takes the time, and, and you can tell that they have a great appreciation because they do feel safe. Mm -hmm. I've been chief for nine years. We've had eight homicides. Nobody ran away. I mean, it's, it's part of doing business, and, and violence and death can be part of what goes on in American society in the year 2016. But even in the light of the worst things that have happened here, people have understood it accepted it and we moved forward and again that's a great credit to the community and and i'll agree with your point about feeling safe that there's no way that i want to be having a conversation about having to cut staff when when the police department has been asking for staff for several years in a row so under a no override scenario um, it worries me. You had a real life uh, sort of terrorism test last year at one of the schools, and oh, I, you. I, yeah. I felt like it was, you know, high profile and really well handled, and it made me feel really comfortable um, with the way the um, the police just department responded to that. So um, I hope that we don't get into that situation of having to cut stuff. No, and, and we do. I say, and we do as much as the um, 
the 99% of the time we have a great quality of life here, we do get those big city crimes. So, you know, we do feel that urban, all the big time, you know, we've had a great deal of work with the schools on just day-to-day -day preparation. If, if you're following the news at all right now, we're going through a significant series of bomb threats. There's been about four to six each day for the past week. Mm -hmm. um, we are one of the few departments that actually staffs a EOD bomb canine unit, to a, a, a female officer and her partner. Um, that was paid for by the Department of Homeland Security, and it just kind of grew out of the marathon. It was just it's not something we were looking for. It kind of landed on us. But now, just in the world we live in, she's one of the busier people. We, she, we send her a lot of places. She was in Weymouth all day on Friday. Um, but we do spend a lot of time preparing for that because we have had our share of big-time events happen and here, and, and, and they've done very well in handling them, and that's a good thing. <coughs> Steve has a question. Chief, when um, Chief Grant was here, he was talking about contracted minimum staffing. Is that something that you have to work around as well, or is that not? So staffing, I really don't usually, because I don't have a contractual the way he does. But we do have a staffing sure. that we, and <clears throat> the difference between him and myself is, um, because I try to, I'm going to live within the overtime. There's a lot of to me. From what, and you've been very good about. That's been my priority. Like when we, especially, what do we need? I'm like, I need to have X amount, um, and we live in that X amount. So it's a give and take for me. Um, probably, I mean, sometimes you can get burnt, but we're very good with supervisors about if the shift commander knows something serious going on and they need to bring help and we tell them to do it. And they're very judicial about doing it. I, I can't say that there are those that abuse it. They have to create an incident, write the log, justify why they're doing it, and 99.9% .9 of the time when they do do it, it's something warranted. You know, it's just, you get something, a curveball, something happens, they just don't see. But I don't have a contractual the way the fire department does. So you just staff according to <clears throat> yeah. the So we staff according to days. Like we beef history. up, we, we pump it up on weekends and we'll cut it back on, and even though, you know, we'll cut it back on weekdays, we'll build it up on days and first tops and we'll cut back on midnight shifts. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a way that it works. Related question on staffing. Can, can you talk for a few minutes about your um, thought process behind the diversity of your staff and, and how that goes into hiring and maintaining your, your force? So I will say this is not easy. It's very hard. Under, the, under working under the, the guidelines of civil service, mm -hmm. because we're, we're an HIT department, so it's... Um, we are a very diverse agency, although um, we work very hard to, and I, I'm, I'm in the process of doing this now, make sure that the police department is reflective of this community in race, in age, and in gender. Um, from a f gender perspective, we have probably one of the highest rates of female officers in the Commonwealth, up around 30%. There are some days that the entire day shift and the supervisor are women. Now, is the husband and father of female police officers? <laughs> which I know, which growing up in a house with five boys, I didn't, I didn't even have any sisters. Um, I'm very proud of that. And I'm very proud of that. As far as diversifying in how we pick our people, the best tool we have to do that is our cadet program. We're one of only three communities in the Commonwealth that have that. So we target um, college age kids, 18 to 22, give our own separate exam, and we work very hard to get a very diverse profile which sometimes can take a lot of work. Sometimes you put a lot of work in and you, and you lose. We had a kid a couple of years ago, we spent, and, I, and I give this kid, I won't name him, but I give him a lot of credit. He's a Cape Verdean. He spent two and a half years here. He was appointed to the police academy. And the Friday before, he called me up and said, it's just not for me, Chief. That's a hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. These are $100,000 a year jobs. Yeah. You know, this is a great <clears throat> profession today. This kid, he... Got his bachelor's, got his master's degree, was all set to go, and when it was given to him, it just wasn't for him. Mm -hmm. And uh, I give him a lot of credit for that. And But that's a kid who you really worked hard. We developed, he came in at 18 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
Does that could happen to anybody. That does could the cadet happen. program reach out to specific schools? So in the cadet program is, is governed by a statute. It's mm -hmm. not a civil service friendly thing. Okay. <clears throat> it was created under the Boston Police. They were the ones who created it. Um, Cambridge is the second one who has it, and we were the third. And the reason it was passed in Milton, which was in 1986, was specifically to diversify the. So, any, it's we work hard to get. It's um, supposed to be for kids of Milton, but f when it was first written, for kids of color, we we're allowed to go outside of Milton, but we haven't had to do that because the, the pool here is so diverse. Mm -hmm. Just kids from Milton that uh, almost exclusively now. The ones that are coming on the job are from, are from Milton. Um, I was happy to hear your number on uh, women on the force. Uh, I asked that question because I happen to see a lot of women. I don't know if my beat is just oh, <laughs> particularly staffed by women. Um, I was surprised that actually 30 sounds a little bit low compared to what I was going to expect you to say, but clearly it's a point of pride for you. I'm wondering, do you have anything to compare that to, to any other communities? Do you know how they are staffed oh. with men versus women? So, I don't want to, I don't want to, Boston could be close. I don't know, it's, I don't think it's that high that could be close. Cambridge is around the same. I think they have like 45, but they have 300 something offices. Um, I think we're higher, I know we're higher than Quincy, we're higher than Randolph, we're higher than Kent, we're higher than Braintree, we're higher than Wyoming, I mean, we're, we're pretty high. I give you my, so my oldest daughter is on the Hanover Police, her and one other woman. Yeah. That's it. That's it. And she's been on for, she was in the Marines. She was, uh, she's been on, I think, seven years. And no women have been hired since she's been there. It, it, it's definitely, I, I'll be honest with you. When I became a policeman, there were two women on the job. It was a male-driven. Right. And I don't mean this against, because I'm so proud of all, and I'm so proud of the profession as a toll, and even though it's not perfect, but I, they changed the face of policing. They truly did. It just, it's a different, they bring just a different dynamic into the profession. It's, it's totally different, but in a, in a really better way. Mm -hmm. I mean, women, and uh, listen, I've, women are very good about, particularly if they're very, you know, if they're physical stat, because this is a physically, can be, a, you're going to get bumped and bruised in this job. Mm -hmm. You just are. And even though, Assailants saw uh, perpetrators can come in all shapes and sizes. The majority of them are men. <clears throat> and um, like here, domestics and anything alcohol, drug, those are like our bigger issues that we deal with. So those are times where often it's going to get involved in much more than like turn on and put your hands behind your back or sit down. Or, you know, that's where physical interactions become a higher percentage. And women are very good about knowing how to win a fight with their mind and their mouth. They really are. They're very, very good at that. Where men often, like when I, ego was everything. You know, if you looked at a cop the wrong way, you were coughed, and everything was wrong. It's just, it's just how, it's just, I mean, it's, it's a unique thing. So they're, they're very good in that aspect, and I'm, I'm proud of that. I really am. They just, um, like I look at, uh, just, I'll pick one out of a hat. I was, I was the Martin Luther King celebration on Monday night, and, there was a video they made of uh, about six or eight high school kids sitting around. And they were just talking about issues of social justice and racism and contemporary issues that a lot of people don't want to talk about today. And when they talked about people in this school system, in this town, who they deal with, who saw the real picture, who saw beyond just color or sex, or they talked about cops and the teachers. And I, I thought that was a great credit to them. Good. So. Well, I, I appreciate your comment that you try to have a force that reflects the population that you serve, because I think that's important. Oh, it is. It's very, you know, uh, one of the things I say is, when they were burgin, burning down Ferguson, Missouri, they were coming to our station of hot dogs. And that's not always going to be the way. You know, I, I, God knows what might happen tomorrow. I don't know what will happen tomorrow. I don't know what might happen five minutes from now. I've learned in the 30 years I've been here that you never know where you're going to be standing in a second away. And uh, so 
I do know that when I go to sleep at night, I never have to worry. I don't worry about who's out there. I know something bad might happen a lot of nights, something does, but um, it's a, they do a great job for us. They really do. And the community is, I think they understand a great deal that this community is very strongly behind them. So that's good. Well, thanks. Ted, you had a question? Yeah. Um, on the cadet program, uh, you have two vacancies right there. Right now, yeah. They we're in the process of filling, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. And, and you have one patrolman vacant, according two. to the... Two. two. And we're in the process of filling those as well. Okay. Great. So the... And, and uh, just... And it's funny we're having this because there's a big push in Massachusetts to go out of civil service. And about eight departments around us have gone out in the past two years. And part of the reason is, like, we wanted to hire these in September. Civil service. The test, one list, it's tied. New list are just... And, and I said to them the other day, I'm like, it's just it's too slow for 2016. As you know, and we've talked about this, the difference between hiring a policeman and Mary Gormley hiring a teacher. So Mary hires a teacher, they're in the, they're in the classroom, let's say, two weeks later. When you hire a police officer, just by the training, just what, what they're required to do st by statute, you, it's almost a year before you see them. Right. Before they're like, out, you know, your tax dollars is totally, it's not going towards their training equipment. When it's, but that's how much this job has changed. I mean, today, it's contemporary issues and everything from fair and equitable policing to... I mean, DV still rates very high. Uh, we, if, if you follow the press at all, we were fortunate with, to receive part of a, uh, an Executive Office of Public Safety Violence Against Women Act Award where we have a, a um, DV advocate that spends 25 hours, hours a week with us at the station. And I was just grabbing out of a hat. I walked into Kathleen and I said, uh, um, she does us in Randolph, and I said, how many cases are you carrying so far this year? She says to me, 75. I said, what? She says, 75. I was like, I just, but it's still a very, very busy on our radar screen all the time. Um, we wanted to get back to the questions that we had sent you. I, I had asked you about um, the click it or t ticket okay. revolving fund mm -hmm. because it seems like all your other funds, as <clears throat> per usual with a revolving fund, money comes in and money goes out. But for some reason on that one, there wasn't an expenditure listed right. for fiscal for year last 15. year. You so, did say that you are spending that money. I just wanted to clarify that. So click it or ticket is a, is a uh, <coughs> state highway safety initiative. So Lieutenant Alba, who handles like the fleet and equipment and all that, so what he's been trying to do, because... I try to keep the new equipment the same all the time. So he's been trying to update with new radars and new new iPad tablets in the cruises. So he's been building up so he got enough money to like, so he could do all the cars in one year. So that's what he's putting in this year. He's updating equipment. Because when we get it back, we can use it either personnel off or equipment related to the cook of the ticket endeavor, which is speed traffic enforcement. Mm -hmm. Great. And there was another question that was asked about uh, the expansion of businesses in Milton and, and what the effect that might have on your uh, department. You did note that building higher-end businesses doesn't tend to cause a lot of nuisance calls, um, but also that the new owners of Novara kicked in some money. Um, do you want to, for a new traffic camera, which was great, and one of our other members commended you for the recent work that, that the department had done in East Milton with working on the, um, the traffic and whatnot. Do you want to make a comment about that? So... And I was at the Chamber of Commerce meeting yesterday, and it was a very spirited discussion. East Milton is probably, well, not just East Milton, Central Art Business District as well. The whole fine dining, I would call it. Is that, if I want to look at it, the whole fine dining movement in Milton? Because a lot of people do say to me, like, oh, you got these liquor licenses now and all this. And, and one of the things I say to them is, look, at, that's true. But we're not putting up, like, TGI Fridays and Pop 90. You know, when the, we're putting in some very fine establishments. So as far as, like, from a crime, tranquility, public, public quality of life, you know, <coughs> and, um, we don't have a lot of issues at any of them. Great. Steel and Rye, we've had a few incidents where you'll get that urban, some of on the cars were broken into or things like that. There's been a few of those. Um, Novara and Abbey, it's a, it's definitely, if you fought, and I've spent nights, I was there, I walked that again last night, um, it's definitely changed the face of East Milton at night, there's no doubt about it, I mean, it's just, I'll give you an example, so last Wednesday night, I left, 
I spoke to um, the PTO at PS. I left there and I went to both. It was nine ten. I walked into Novara. That was my fr other than I went to the, you know, the opening thing because I really there's such a labor love for the Falcones. I really I've watched this. I visited it every week. I I just had took up an interest in this. Not just because there were policing issues that we're definitely going to have to work <coughs> on, but I just wanted to see this. And um, so at nine ten I went in. I made it about from myself to Donald and turned around and walked out. Yeah. I said, I don't walk over to Abbey Park. I don't know Abbey Park. Packed. I said, wow, this is really... And it's funny, if, if you're from Milton and you go in, people are always asking, like, do you know steal or Do you go here? Do you? And the other thing is, I'm amazed how many people I know that are from outside of Milton say, yeah, I'm coming to go to such and such a restaurant tonight. So it gives us a different dynamic as far as people out, people moving. The square is going to take... Not is going, is taking some effort on our part, tweaking it, changing parking spaces, getting turnover, um, just policing as well, traffic, and the valets. I, tomorrow we have a traffic commission with the valet. We're thinking of moving valets to both sides of the street for Novara and Abbey. It's that being used that much. Um, it's definitely a change, but I would say it's their changes in a positive way, but it's definitely a increase in foot and pedestrian traffic. And East Milton looks a lot different than it did when those two weren't there. Mm -hmm. A lot different, these two, than Blockbuster and a Coles movie theater. Blockbuster being the prior, you know, the prior tenant. To, it's a total different thing. <laughs> and now you I put in the plate. Does, hey, you yes. put in the plate. Video to go, wasn't it? Video it was, to go. Well, whatever. Well, <laughs> video to go. Video to go. Close, close. <laughs> whatever. It was, hey, listen, it was 5 and 10 when we moved here. Um, <laughs> so... Do any of you remember the five? You remember the five and ten? Do you remember the name of the owner? So his name was Mr. Braga, and if you want it, he 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 was a very finely dressed man, and the five and ten was really like an offshoot of a World War. So it sold everything from matchbox cars to hats and gloves and glue and whatever. You need. It, it just Mr. Braga patrolled the front of the store back and forth every day, and if you were a kid and you went in there. You better have money in your pocket because if you weren't in there, you were out the door. Very you did not have business. <laughs> so when I first came on the job, we still had walking routes in the square, and that's something we're working at again now. Um, and I remember going in there in uniform, and there he was standing there. Here I was, this young cop, and I said, "Are you going to shoot me out the door too, or do I have to buy something?" <laughs> it's, just, it's just how much it's. So it, it's definitely, but I do view it as a positive. These are definitely, you know, who would have ever thought that Milton would be a destination for open table mm -hmm. ever and it's not over yet but I, I mean I, who knows what so I think in that aspect it's really good so it, it does draw more attention for us but I'm not going to say in any way shape or form that I see it really as a negative mm -hmm. more during the day the traffic stuff during the day with the trucks going and loading and moving that's taking some effort on us to try and get this to work right mm -hmm. great other questions for Chief Wells? Yep. Um, last year, so Quincy Hospital closed, right. and we were just starting that. A lot of the uh, traffic was getting to Milton, and you were concerned about that, especially with the, uh, you know, a lot of the opioid issues. I don't know if you could just comment on how things have gone <coughs> this year, so good, bad, or different. Still evolving, very busy. Um, and I give it to you in two parameters. And again, just as I commented, Curry in the schools, the yeah, Deaconess, PETA, Cindy Page, great partners. I think they recognize it as well. Um, so for us, other than the opiate, you know, and calls, the big thing was mental health. And I, I really want to thank them. They knew from our, and we've met a lot on this, they knew from our perspective, it's not a mental health facility. And the demand on mental health facilities is dramatic in the state, not just here, everywhere. And the problem that they were having and we were having is we were being required to manage long-term individuals who should have been in facilities, but there's just no beds. So they've built a five-bed secure facility off the ER, which I am very happy with, which makes it, for our point, like we were there all weekend on an individual this weekend. Um, and... Um, it was a unique case, and it required a constant attention, a constant presence. I don't see that going away. We go to the ER a lot, um, partly as well because of the whole Quincy. They're catching. If if you know, it's pretty easy. If you if and I'll give it to you. 
just drive around. If you drive anywhere around this area of Milton, pay attention during the day. Don't just look at Fallon. How many Brewster ambulances you're seeing coming from Guernsey? How many Boston Health and Hospitals ambulances are coming in from Boston High Park? It, it tells you. I'll just drive up in the emergency room and see how many ambulances are lined up there. So um, we're busy. We, we I say, a very um, active and progressive partnership we have with them. Um, <coughs> but I don't see that issue going away. They're going to remain <coughs> one of our frequent flyer customers for the pretty much immediate future. It's a great question, Chuck. Thanks. Um, if somebody were to look at your salary page, mm -hmm. they might notice, I know there's a lot that goes into uh, how much different people get paid, but they might notice that you're not the highest paid person on your department. <laughs> do, you, um, do you have a, any comment for that or how that situation exists or why it might? No, that's a long, have you followed the press lately? <laughs> Are you going to select? No, I just, I don't, you know, it's funny for most of the time I've been chief, I don't really think about money as the, um, I've, I've definitely, as Kathy Fagan said to me today, you've definitely put aside money that you should have fought for them. But I don't, I don't, these people, you know, when, when, um, when I was a kid, when Bill White was a selectman, when my dad was a policeman, this was more a job. You know, it was, it didn't pay that well. For my father, he worked as a policeman during the day, and there were three of them that loaded mail trucks five nights a week at South Postal to make extra money. And um, education and, and the, the demands that were placed upon policing has really made it morph into the profession that it is. But policing isn't easy on an individual, man, woman, doesn't matter. You know, you're out, you're away from your family, holidays, you commit a lot of hours. Um, so I don't worry about really so much about myself. I worry more about them. I, I, I guess in a way, um, I view myself not just as a chief, but almost like a father to them in, in, in many ways. So that that's not something I, I didn't even think. I don't even. I don't even look. I don't look at that problem. You do. I don't. <laughs> I'll Questions? tell them that though when I go back tomorrow. <laughs> Ted. So. You mentioned that you have a lot of contracts. Yes. Okay. And so I have to say that if I look at your Schedule A, you got big goose eggs all the way across the contract line. And, and the reason we, we put that line in there was so that if you had contracts for services, you could stick it in there, and if it was going to go up 10%, we could protect it from any kind of... <coughs> leveling action or zero dollar budget action or anything like that. So, but if you don't stick the contracts in there separate from the other general expenses, we can't, we can't protect that level of expense. So when I say, so let's say, sir, all right, so instead of contract, I refer to them as service agreements. You're talking, when I think we go contract then to that, so zero is like, I don't have any leases. I don't lease anything, but so I have service agreements. You have on service air. agreements on equipment. Equipment, radios, radio maintenance, yeah. um, repeaters. And the people who provide generators. these generators. The people who provide these services probably want to increase that charge to you every year. So yeah, we work. Yeah. So what I do, some of them are static, but okay. some of them like the I, I just use the radio equipment service agreement every year I'll be tough on that because they'll try to push it up every single year they try to bump it up and what I try to do is flip some radios in and I extend my warranties as long as I can to keep that price either static or drop it down that's just one of them as, as I'm using as an example but it's so I know what you're saying about zero. I don't have any contracts as way of like leases I don't lease equipment I don't my contracts mm -hmm. I refer to would be like service agreements. Okay, but... but <clears throat> like my service, so like, I'll give you an example. My membership in Vapor on the Boston, that doesn't change. My membership in Metrolec, that doesn't change. Mm -hmm. My membership in certain o organizations, those don't change. So I wouldn't call those so much contracts. I just call that a static yeah, service that's membership. But So all the equipment like in the emergency room, room setup and all that, you pay for none of that. 
i.e. the through and there's Chase no grant money or uh, the LEPC puts a lot of their money towards it okay. um, so the emergency operations center costs you minimal money if any at all if any at all I mean, Although that's, they, no, that's I'll give fine. you an example. so that's I'll give you an example that's a good question so ideally they would want me to have like a fifteen thousand dollar year contract and I view that as a waste of money and I'd rather hire a technician to fix something versus I I'll give you an example the cameras because I go back to the camera question you asked me about the cameras so the cameras are a great asset and I want to thank the Falcones because when the Falcones were building it's something we can always add to last year you helped me was the first time we've ever taken any town money you helped us with a capital to bump up to extend the cameras over to this side of town mm -hmm. um, the initial the infrastructure the money all that came through Department of Homeland Security the Falcones when they were discussing going through the whole planning board ZBA process there were a lot of concerns from the neighbors of, for security but the things they were suggesting like chain across the parking lot or things like that I'm like look at and that's where I just went to them and said, look, this is the 21st century. You want 21st century security, you get 24-hour video surveillance. And Bob Falcone, to his credit, said, how much? What would you need? I said, I think we need two cameras to cover that end of the square. He pointed it up, and he paid the 10000 for that. But going back to ideally, I could have, I could put in and try and fight, but I'd rather, as they say, we've been living in the level dollar, I'd rather just like... Just try and <coughs> go through it. It's a having service contracts that are a great safety net, mm -hmm. but I think it's more of a luxury, and I'd rather put the dollars towards something more important, like you know, things like overtime, things of that nature, than service agreements, service contracts, lease agreements. Does that answer that for you, Ryan? Yeah, I'm, I'm. You're I'm, confused when you talk about the 24-hour <coughs> surveillance cameras. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's a, how many are there in town? How many feeds are there? Oh, Who's God. looking at all this? That's a wow. lot of equipment to maintain, isn't it? So in-house, we're able to utilize, like Rob, he, he understands the whole system. The schools have Bob Patterson who understand. I mean, you want to take whatever you can and get a skill level up so that you can fix these, little, which we do. Um, we do use the town's electricians a lot when, if there's a problem on a pole, because a lot of times you can fix it easily, and they would rather have you pay them like fifteen thousand one stop shopping, do it all. But I just think there's a bit of bang in your dollar than paying all these contracts, at least all these <coughs> contracts. But it's not. It's it's. <clears throat> I mean, one thing we were able to do was we got that we took all our. We use a lot of the dark fiber, which costs you nothing, which was came through some mitigation money, so we use that as much as we can. So that saves on cellular costs, things of that nature. It gives you the connection, gives you a better feed. We've upgraded all of our cameras to high def from the initial. So we've done a pretty good job getting our best bang for our dollar. There's no high-end thing, and I want to answer, you brought up a good question, because I think sometimes in the in the world and I say to people today you should be of the mindset that if you walk out in the public you may be on a camera there's not a criminal investigation anywhere that you're not looking at cameras whether they're privately owned or publicly supported um, but one of the things that I no one sits and looks you couldn't you, you it doesn't matter what's here in New York City you, can, you can't sit and watch a camera 24 7 you'll lose your mind but what we do do today the way we have them mounted in our operations center is that once an incident happens at a location, the dispatchers will immediately shift to the cameras in that location and start to bring up and update officers going there in real time, like what's going on. We have cameras around all the banks. Bank robberies are a big thing here. Although bank robberies, which most of you don't know, is when someone robs a bank, it's a good 10 minutes before we get a call. We don't take a call from a bank in a bank robbery. Most people don't know that. Banks, by policy, call their in-house security, and then they make the determination to call us. You don't get the 911 from the cell phone call of the, of the teller. It just doesn't happen. So there's always wow. so for the most of bank responses, there's a pretty good delay by the time. The good thing is though, and our guys just did a good job. They're doing a solve on a robbery now. Was down in Lower Mills is that 
caught him on two cameras. He went down the stairs, got him on the first camera. He walked the bike path to Central Ave, got him on the second camera. It was good. Great. But it's not always that easy. <clears throat> CSI only exists on CBS. <laughs> <laughs> and even not there anymore, really. Um, any other questions? Thanks so much for coming in tonight. I really appreciate it. We're going to take a five-minute break and come right back. We'll have a quick discussion, and then uh, we'll be out of here. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Two things to discuss. One is the meeting that Ted and I had um, yesterday with Anne Marie and Amy, and then I want to talk about the schedule for a couple of minutes. Is there um, anything else that folks wanted to talk about tonight? Okay, let me know by the end if you have a question. So we had a great meeting yesterday. Um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, we came up with um, a deficit on the non-contingent budget of about, <coughs> and I talk in round numbers versus the exact numbers that Ted talks in, but if you want an exact number, raise your hand and we will ask Ted for it. But uh, we, we came up with uh, um, about, sure, $1.1 $1 million uh, shortfall. Uh, it's a little in excess of that. And the way that that breaks down is you look at the total percentage of the operating budget that the schools have and the total percentage of the operating budget that the rest of the town has, and it's about 64% um, uh, for the schools. So you allocate that same percentage of the budget shortfall to the schools and then the rest to the rest of the town, and uh, you come up with an approximate $720,000 shortfall for the schools and an approximate $400,000 shortfall for the rest of the town. Um, so it would be up to the schools to figure out how to distribute that number, and we did give a heads up uh, to the school committee yesterday afternoon. Um, and then we might have uh, more of a hand in, in helping to determine how that cut would be done on the town uh, side that isn't the school, uh, but we would work obviously with Anne Marie on that since um, the budgets uh, report up to her. Um, I just wanted to underscore a couple of points that we talked about with them. Uh, one is that there is no free cash to the rescue this year. There, there may be some um, e interest in using some free cash to cover some of the shortfall as we have in the last two years, but Anne Marie confirmed that when she went to the ratings agencies, she told them last year what the plan was, which was we were gonna use some free cash for operating expenses that were not one-time items, one last time, and then we were gonna go for an override for fiscal year 17. So if we don't go for an override for fiscal year 17, or it fails, um, we really can't go back to what we did last year, which was using um, one-time monies to uh, duct tape the, um, the operating budget because that will look bad to the rating agencies, and that will cause a self-fulfilling prophecy of us uh, of us uh, going in the wrong direction financially. So um, we want to maintain that promise that we made to them, and uh, so free cash will be used for one-time items this year. Um, so that brings us to we're either going to have cuts or we're going to have an override. Um, Ted, are there, those are my highlights. Are there, any, are there any specifics that you want to fill in from that conversation? Um, we are going to use about 140000 of free cash for items in budgets, but, that, but they're sick leave buybacks and maybe a little legal fee. Um, so the question is then, well, what are, what are we doing with free cash? And, and uh, um, generally, generally, we've asked in the past each department if they had a, a little wish list or you know, something that fell through the cracks below the $10,000 apl application level for the uh, Capital Improvement Planning Committee that Steve sits on, um, and you know above zero, but wouldn't fit into their budget. You know, uh, and we haven't done much of that. Uh, we just got 
we just got a re the recommendation from the Capital Improvement Planning Committee for what they might like to, sp to spend free their recommendation for, as they put it, uh, non-bonded capital items. And they've recommended more, uh, $758,000 of that, and it's more than I think we have room for if, if the kindergarten thing goes forward, who knows. Can we ask Steve? Do you do you know how you came up with that figure of seven hundred fifty-eight thousand? I mean, we can ask Amy when she yeah, comes. Yeah, I mean, Monday, there was a there was a mixture of capital costs, borrowing costs, which don't hit for a couple. You know, the items that you bond, if you purchase them in seventeen and bond them in seventeen, then they have no impact on the debt service in seventeen, but. In 18. Yeah, we're talking the the right. So that leaves room against it, and <coughs> you know the the possibility that there would be more free cash than or an interest in using free cash for non-recurring items, some of the more expensive stuff. Um, I don't know if you, you want to look at that because we should have some thoughts about it. Sure. I have a question. Sure. What is your question? So, if we try for an override and it fails, mm -hmm. and so we have to cut positions, like we just heard the police chief say, that there's a couple, I gotta get rid of a police officer probably, or something. Probably two. Or two, to get, you know, save the $400,000 on the town side, and the school does something like that. But we'll have, we don't know how much free cash we're gonna get. No, yeah, we we know. At that point, we the, we got it. At we that point, the budget. The at that point, the budget will have already been voted, and so if the override were to fail, the non-contingent budget would be in effect, and so those cuts would be made. Those cuts would be made, but there would be free cash that we would go inside. The, the free capital. cash. No, the free cash will have cash already will have been committed. To hold that. on. Hold on. Will have been if the if the budget if the override fails. The non-contingent budget will be in effect. The non-contingent budget will have already spent all of the free cash on a few one-time items that Ted mentioned earlier, including yeah. sick leave buyback, and the rest of it will go to capital committee, things like our, um, our funds that, w that we need to maintain monies in, and et cetera, et cetera. So we will get to a zero number on free cash before right. that override but passes. But what it sounds like we're doing is it just sounds like my household budget wouldn't operate that way. If I somehow had like a 10% cut and I'd say, well, I'm sorry, you know, we're going to like fire some police officers or something, but we need to buy a new piece of capital equipment because it's been committed. I just didn't, I'm asking the question. Mm -hmm. if, you, if, yeah. if, if I may, because this is a continual thing that goes on that the town undervalues and underinvests in its capital infrastructure till it gets to the point where the fire department buildings are falling apart or the libraries falling apart or the schools are falling apart that people you know and it's a it's the nature of things you know you say okay well we don't want to cut services if we can cut these investments and so that's why your roads have eight zillion potholes right. and so you blow out a couple tires and you ruin your suspension and you don't make that connection that I just spent six hundred dollars to fix that that if I had spent you know, another fifteen dollars on my taxes. That maybe there would be money to fix that. So, you know, th th there's not, other than the capital planning committee, anybody that's really lobbying on behalf of the capital investments of the community. And that's a problem, and it's a continuing problem, and it, it just doesn't it doesn't go away. So, I get what you're saying, but if you were in the house and you had to either cut back on food a little bit or fix the roof because that was going to ruin the house, then you'd say, no, that's a hard decision, and let's talk about that. That was a better analogy, and I would continue to buy the food, but I'm talking about something I don't hope happens. I, I hope an override passes. I'm mean, just saying, we're going to work for it. All right. Darnell, did you have something to add? Uh, no? No. I, it, this is like, <laughs> I, we got to stop this, <laughs> you know, because we have roads in this town. I, my thing is I was going to question on have we even looked at adopting a couple of roads to like just basically resurface, even if we can't do what they always talk about, the deep surfacing and stuff of these roads. These roads in this town are atrocious. And to do nothing at all, to look at that, 
is just as bad as doing nothing at all to look at, you know, a roof in 15 years for this place and everything else. We have done nothing for the roads in this town that meant anything, and we have policies that we're not going to work on roads in this town until we can do some great deep, you know, digging and replacing and, you know, just resurface a couple of these things. If it lasts 10 years, well, that's what it's going to last. Roads because certainly, you're not going to get anything else Roads done. certainly come up a lot in this meeting, and let's you, definitely you know, talk about it when yeah. we have DPW in here. We're going to schedule that for right after but a special I'm saying, town meeting. We're going to have free cash. I hope we can adopt yeah. the road, adopt a couple of these streets out here so I don't keep ruining cars on them. You know? Chuck, did you have something? I did. Um, so the 950,000 schools... Well, that's, that's my... What you're looking at is a possibility. Got it. Okay, this is, I put, even put a TH there, this is my spreadsheet. Okay, okay. oh, all right, good. All right. So I, I, I get it. All right. okay. So, I mean, I just recall um, that the schools the last schools year had... are proposing this. All right, but okay. could they, could the schools, um, I'm just thinking out loud here, maybe, which I shouldn't do, I'm on camera, but I don't care. Um, if, the, if the override doesn't pass, I mean, it, it was my understanding last year that they have they have quite a bit of one-time expenses that they could use free cash on. The schools last year, I thought, used four or five hundred thousand dollars on a free cash on one-time things like they did books and the like, and one-time rounds of professional development and things like things that. like that. So, and could the material. school say, "Well, we've been living with uh, pay for your own kindergarten for a while." And I'd rather save a bunch of teachers, and I'd rather use free cash on professional development and books, which will free up operating money. You know what I mean? Could, could that happen? Is that a possibility? Um, I guess that's a potential. Okay. Uh, I would say I'm not just hearing the desire or need for free all-day kindergarten from just the schools. Uh, I'm hearing that from a lot of different hey, constituencies. No, I know. I think it would be. It town. seems like a great deal. I'm yeah. just thinking of if and, the override. And I will say pass. that that opting to sort of duct tape the the budget with some some of the uh, free cash uh, and not do free full day kindergarten really lets a golden opportunity slip away. And as we heard from the schools, it could create a worse situation for us next year because the funding for those half-day students might actually go away. So we could right. end up with a significant yeah. budget shortfall the next year if that funding from the state goes away and we don't suddenly have funding for any day kindergarten. So that's, that's a serious concern. Ted? Yeah, on this, I just want to get a couple things straight about the process here from Mike, and, and also I want to address a little bit the kindergarten. Um, we have to come up with two budgets, a non-contingent budget, which balances to our revenue, yep. um, and then a contingent budget, which would balance to our revenue plus an override amount that is yet to be determined. Um, if, if the, the contingent budget doesn't, um, the contingent budget may pass at town meeting, okay? Town meeting may say, we think this is responsible and a good way to go. But then it has to pass after town meeting at the ballot box, okay? And if it doesn't pass there, the non-contingent budget takes effect. Whatever, whichever way it's designed. There's no do-over of the non-contingent budget. Like, you know, the schools can't say, oh, we didn't get kindergarten or, or we didn't get the, the contingent budget. We'd like a do-over and do something different. So if they go with the 950,000 of, or, or if we recommend that, 950 of the free cash for, for kindergarten, uh, because that's a one-time cost and then it gets reimbursed right. in the following year, the schools are going to have to find $150,000 somewhere in their non-contingent budget to launch the kindergarten because the, that, that will be their recurring cost uh, is $150,000. And they don't have that in their non-contingent budget. So it would be a bizarre situation to have $950,000 voted to the schools of one time for kindergarten 
have the override fail, then they would have to dig even deeper into their <coughs> non-contingent budget and fire, I don't know, three more teachers in order to launch the kindergarten program. So that, that would be a problematic thing. Um, I don't know. Other questions on that point? Ted, I actually, I think I want to hold off on having the conversation sure. about um, the rest of the free cash pool for right now, just given timing, because I do think we'll have time to do that another night, and I'd like to have Amy here for it anyhow. Um, Great. Okay, so on the schedule, let me just talk very quickly about the next uh, two meetings, and then even quicker about the next four meetings after that. Next week, we're going to have a full week. On Monday, the 25th, we have Susan Galvin, Anne-Marie Fagan, and Amy Dexter to come in to talk about their budgets. That's going to be a big night for us. Then on Wednesday, the 27th, we have Joe Prondack coming in to talk uh, and Bill Ritchie coming in to talk. Um, so we're going to go over two budgets that night. That should be a, a pretty full night on consolidated services and inspectional services. The week after that, February 1st and February 3rd. I don't have speakers lined up to fill those agendas just yet, so I'm working on that over the next couple of days, and I'll get back to you on what we're going to do on that schedule. Um, then, of course, the week after that, Monday the 8th is special town meeting, and um, why don't we chat next week about how we're, how we're feeling about how many budgets we've lined up and what the march to the end of uh, the month looks like and um, whether or not we're going to need to meet that Wednesday or not. Um, I have started a spreadsheet on how many folks that we need to bring in to do presentations and who we've already seen and when we're going to be voting on the budgets. Um, so I'll have a much better handle on that early next week um, for what we need to accomplish uh, for the next couple of meetings. But big week next week. Yes, Steve. Question. Um, if, as with the clerk and the accountant coming in, do should we funnel questions through you or through the subcommittee chair to them? If you have questions that you want to send them in advance, um, feel free to send it to them and to copy me. Okay. That's totally fine. Okay. Yep, Ted. I think Brian was handling Amy's budgets. If um, <clears throat> so, you could also, I presume. Send them to Brian and copy Lee Michael. Steve? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? We're adjourned. <laughs>